What is up, Janksters? It's your boy, Graham, also known as HamHawks42 on the internet, and today we have more Dominaria United spoilers. We don't quite have the full set yet, but we are getting close, and I wanted to talk about some of the key highlights that we've seen come out in the last day or two, and really break down how we might use them, especially in standard moving forward, but also in other formats. So the first one that I wanted to talk about was Joda the Unifier. Now, if you know Joda, like Joda Archmage Eternal, I believe is the name, uh, is a card that already exists that is based basically Fist of Suns on a creature where you can pay Wooburg instead of paying any mana cost for any freaking spell. Um, so really cool stuff. So naturally Joda was going to do some kind of five color shenanigans and that's what we have here. So Joda is a 5-5 five five <clears throat> legendary human wizard, the casting cost of Wooburg. So one mana of every color and they have legendary creatures you control get plus X plus X, where X is the number of legendary creatures you control. So interestingly enough, the floor on this card is a 6-6 six, six for 5. Because Joda buffs themselves and counts themselves. <laughs> so um, so that's a thing. And additionally, if we have other legendary creatures, they're all going to get very large, as you can imagine. So that's nice. But then also, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Whenever you cast a legendary spell from your hand, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a legendary non-land card with lesser mana value. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this is a legendaries, legendaries matter like card that is going to be in the standard legal set, but it looks like it's designed for commander. I'm getting like first sliver vibes by being able to give all of your legendary creatures effectively cascade or legendary permanents, frankly, cascade for other legendary permanents. And then your legendary creatures get bigger for other legendary creatures. So this is legends, legendary matters on a single card. I think Joda the Unifier is going to be very, very strong now that we have Mirror Box in standard, so we can make the legendary rule just not apply and grow the legends even bigger um, for the, because of the Mirror Box uh, abilities. So that's pretty rad. Um, yeah, that actually has an opportunity to get out of hand, so keep an eye out for that. But that only works if we have good low cost legends and the fact that we're gonna have to be in five colors for this is going to be difficult to pull off at a time when some of our best mana fixing is rotating out. We still have the triumphs, so that's great. However, we are missing the world tree, which if you've ever tried to make a five color deck work, you would need at least two world trees in there because they just kind of tie the room together, so to speak. Now we do have mana dorks that can be helpful in Land of our Lone Speaker. We have, um, you know, and reclusive taxidermist even does tap for any mana. So that might be a thing. We have other cool cards, but I'm thinking of cheap mana producing legends. And the best ones that we have in standard right now are Magda, Brazen Outlaw, who is gonna be cycling out, rotating out rather. And we also have a Sika, the, uh, the God of the Tree, who is who turns all of your legendary creatures into mana rocks um, and gives them all vigilance, which is pretty rad uh, for three. Unfortunately, also rotating out. And because of the Prismatic Bridge on the back end would have fit with Joda very nicely. Now, there might be a Legends Matter deck in Explorer or Historic that leverages some of those pieces. In Standard, I don't think Joda the Unifier is going to be making too many waves. However... I think if the low cost legends in this set are good, we're gonna see this. Um, we already have legendary spells or legendary permanents that are not creatures that can fit in this deck. Mythic Massacre is legendary. Celestis is legendary. These are some great pieces that can help fix our mana, help ramp us up, give us additional value. In the case of Mythic Massacre, um, it would only be we wouldn't X would be zero if we cast it off of this, but still it might provide some value on board if we're doing some other sh shenanigans that synergize with it. I mean, there are a lot of good legends out there. Um, the other thing that I'm curious about this ability that Joda has functions very similarly to cascade. However, it is not cascade as a result. I'm curious in older formats, what happens if you hit Valky? On this. Now, you may remember there was a time when people were using Bloodbright Elf and other Cascade spells to Cascade into Valky, uh, the, the God of Lies, and being able to cast Tybalt Cosmic Imposter, which is a seven drop Planeswalker off of it because of the way the Cascade rules previously worked. Now, Wizards fixed this, changed the way Cascade works, so now when you go to cast the spell, it checks the mana value to see if it's still viable. Um, so in that case, you can cast Valky all day, but you can no longer cast Tybalt off it. I wonder if this works the same way uh, because functionally, <clears throat> it's practically the same thing. 
I would be surprised if that's something that we can abuse again. Um, I think Wizards has learned their lesson because then you could drop Jota, play out a Sika or any three drop legendary, spin into Valky and go nuts. I don't think you're allowed to do that, <clears throat> but I could be wrong. Um, also, all Planeswalkers are legendary. So these are legendary spells that you're putting on the stack that can get pr incredible value and produce crazy stuff too. So I think this card is very strong. If it goes unchecked, it's going to be bonkers. Um, it's going to be kill on sight most of the time. And it produces a really big body on the board right away. So it has an impact even in combat on the turn you play it, which is very important. A lot of combo pieces for weird janky brews like this tend to lack that impact when you first play them, you know, because they're relatively small bodies or they don't have ETB triggers or whatever. Joda has, you know, at the very least a 6-6 body entering the battlefield. So... That's something. Um, I think this card is going to be cool. Keep an eye out for it. I don't know that it's going to see too much competitive play because, like I said, we're going to be losing some mana fixing pieces. But we still have Celestis. There's the new Lotus. I don't know. Jordan might see some play. I'm definitely going to try to build around him. Um, yeah, cool card. I like it. All right, next up, <clears throat> we have Sarah Paragon. This card's a house. I'm not, I'm not going to bury the lead here. This card is incredible. If you are playing white of any kind, you are going to want this card. It is in insane. Three, four flying angel for two white, white. Once during each of your turns, you may play a land from your graveyard or cast a permanent spell with mana value three or less from your graveyard. If you do, it gains when this permanent is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, exile it, and you gain two life. If you remember when Lurus was in standard, now a lot of people complain about Lurus being so incredibly powerful, especially pre-companion nerf, with good reason. Part of the thing that made Lurus so insane was that you could have it as effectively an eighth card in your hand. Yes, that is very, very good. The truth of the matter is, Lurus' ability on its own was cause for concern. It was good enough um, on its own. As somebody who's running at Lurus in a couple of EDH decks, it's incredible even in that format. Even without it being the companion, the card is just incredibly, incredibly powerful. And Sarah Paragon does the Lurus thing, but even better because you can target non-land permanents with mana value three or less instead of two or less. Now, they do get exiled if they leave the battlefield. That's huge. That's a very important detail because you can't recur them indefinitely. That's a big deal. With Lurus, you were able to use like Lurus and Kaya's Ghost Form, which was a one mana enchantment that said if the creature, if a the enchanted creature dies or goes to exile, um, you return to the battlefield. So what you could do is you could put Kai's Ghost Form on Lurus. If your opponent kills Lurus, Lurus comes right back, Kai's Ghost Form's back in your graveyard. If they don't have a second kill spell that turn, you go to your turn, you use Lurus' ability to pull Kai's Ghost Form back, Lurus isn't going anywhere. Bonkers, dumb stuff, super cool. Sarah Paragon will be able to do some shenanigans like that, but it's gonna be limited because if you pull out a Kai's Ghost Form or some one of those, um, you know, Journey to Eternity, for example, one of the one of these auras that reanimates a creature, which is like a great way to take advantage of this. If you were to put that on Sarah Paragon um, and somebody were to kill Sarah Paragon, the stuff triggers, it comes back. That aura is going to be leaving, is going to be going to exile. So that's a big deal. That's a very big deal. Um, so I, but actually it's when this permanent would be put into a graveyard. Oh no, it's when this permanent is put into a graveyard from the battlefield. So it triggers once the permanent goes to the graveyard. So if, oh my goodness, there are some implications there. It's not if this permanent would leave the battlefield. It's when it goes to the graveyard. So we're going to be able to do shenanigans there. We're going to be able to blink stuff. We're going to be able to bounce stuff that we brought back with Sarah Paragon. Keep it in play. We're going to lose that ability. Like this is going to be... This card is going to be cracked. It's going to be great. It's going to be excellent. On top of that, just throwing it out there, you can use Sarah Paragon to pull up Extraction Specialist, which you can use to go pull up another creature that of two or less. I don't know if that line is going to be strong, but I think it's cool. And I am looking forward to seeing something like that happen. I think this card's great. Full stop. It's just great. It's going to be very, very powerful. I think mono white decks are going to want this because it produces a 3-4 body on board. Also, any deck with angels... If you're running Giada, Sarah Paragon is absolutely going to slot in there. In older formats, this can bring your Righteous Valkyrie back from the graveyard. Get out of here. That's absurd. It can also bring your Giada back from the graveyard if you're in standard. I think, I mean, it's going to be great. You know, it gives you more cards in your hand just by being on the battlefield. That's, I mean, that's big time. This is card advantage on a stick. And a 3-4 flying body is no joke. So keep an eye out for this thing. It's going to be great. 
All right, next up, we have Thran Portal. This is yet another card that you're gonna see all over the place. This is a land gate at rare. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or fewer other lands. So it's a fast land, similar to the creature lands from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms or similar to the uh, the fast land from Kaladesh. But Thran, as it enters the battlefield, choose a basic land type. Thran Portal is the chosen type in addition to its other types. And mana abilities with Thran Portal cost an additional one life to activate. So this is kind of, it's a bad city of brass is kind of what we're dealing with. It does hurt you to use it, but you have ultimate flexibility that you can access as early as turn one. So you, and on top of that, it adds the basic land type. So it does help you with your domain triggers. It helps you with, um, you know, if you have effects that say when a swamp enters the battlefield, you know, th you can use Thran Portal to trigger those. Um, you know, it's it's a cool card. It's got a, a lot of cool interplay that I think is really solid. Now, the life loss is very real. It is not a perfect mana fixing option. But if you are running three or four colors, it's probably worth having some in the deck. I don't know how many yet. We'll see. Uh, I think it depends on how aggressive your deck wants to be. If you're trying to run a three color mid range deck that has an aggressive game plan where you're trying to hit Blood Tithe Harvesters, Tenacious Underdogs, those kinds of things on turn two and apply pressure in the early game, Thran Portal is going to be excellent because those decks need good mana fixing at one and two. Now, if you're gonna be in late game control decks, I don't think this is quite as good because it's gonna be entering tapped when it's your fifth, sixth, seventh land, which is, you know, and it only gives you one of the, one type of mana throughout the course of the game. So that's a bit of a bummer. It's gonna be a little bit more restrictive once you get it down. But if those early turns, if you need good fixing in the early turns, this card is gonna do it and it's gonna do it in spades. Also, it's a gate. So Maze's End players out there, you got more toys. Um, not that you need it anymore necessarily, but here we are. Gate is a land type that they're clearly supporting. So, okay, neat. Next up, <clears throat> we have a card that I am unreasonably excited about. Vesuvian Duplomancy. I, I have called this card Vesuvian Diplomacy so many times I cannot tell you, but that's not what it is. It is Vesuvian Duplomancy. This is an enchantment for three and a blue. Whenever you cast a spell that targets only a single artifact or creature you control, create a token that's a copy of that artifact or creature, except it's not legendary. Now, you, you may recognize the style of effect. We have cards like Orvar or already that when it's in play and you target one of your one of your creatures with an instant or sorcery, you get to create a copy of it. OK, cool. Vesuvian Diplomacy is a little bit better because you can target artifacts or creatures. And on top of that, it doesn't have to be an instant or sorcery that you're casting. So you can cast any spell. You can be casting auras. You can be casting. Um, I mean, you can you can be casting auras, you can be casting mutate, those target. You know, if you target something with mutate, you would just get another copy of whatever the base creature was, which may already be a mutate stack with other stuff going on. Like that is going to be very complicated and get very weird. Fortunately, I'm going to be playing this on arena where the client's going to take care of all that crap for me. But this card is sick. It's going to be like, I'm going to slot this in, in, in place of Orvar in a lot of decks. And I'm going to be brewing around this right away. And on top of that, we have other cards that care about targeting already in standard, like Illuminator Virtuoso, or, you know, like those cards that care about stuff, you know, that, that where in the case of Illuminator Virtuoso, you connive every time you target it with something. Um, Storm Chaser Drake, whenever you target it with something, you draw cards. Like the, those cards exist, they're already here. And on top of that, we have cards like Light Paws, where if you're casting auras, all of a sudden you get to create additional auras and cast those and like, and there are even more cards in Dominaria, some of which we'll be talking about later today, that also can help trigger this and do crazy things. So it is a four mana do nothing enchantment. When you play it, it does nothing. It has no impact on the board. You are going to be ha you're going to have to play a very strong control game in order for this to be relevant. Because you're gonna be able to need, you're gonna be you're going to need to stick it out of the field and protect it, which is gonna be a tall ask. And of course, not die in the meantime, which could be tricky uh, with how much aggro is running around right now. And no doubt will continue to be running around post, post rotation. But I think the top end, the value on this card is insane. And also the fact that it can copy legendaries is cracked. Like 
it's going to be possible. There are going to be decks that are running Vesuvian Duplomancy and Jinja Taxis. And with that, what you're able to do, you can't quite go infinite. I've, I've wrestled with the stack. At least it's you won't be able to go infinite right away with it. Um, but over time, you may be able to get there, be able to create some infinite loops if you have, get multiple gins down. But Jinja Taxis says if you cast an instant or sorcery or an artifact, you copy it. So if you tar if you cast an instant or sorcery that targets Jinja Taxes, you make another copy of Jinja Taxes. That spell resolves. But then you can copy you can target Jinja Taxes again with another spell and get another copy of Jinja Taxes. Your new Jinja Taxes triggers. Like as you can imagine, that could get out of hand very, very fast. Now that's a four drop, do nothing, and a seven drop, do nothing that you need to stick on the battlefield and still have gas in your hand. That's a tall ask. I don't think this card is going to see competitive play at all. But as far as weird janky brews, keep an eye out. If you have a favorite janky brew content creator, they're going to have a deck with this. They're going to have at least one deck that takes advantage of this card. I know I will. So hit that subscribe button if you want to keep an eye out for what I put together with this thing. Because it's going to happen. It's, it's going to be super fun, actually. All right, next up. <clears throat> this is far less janky. This is just down the middle, great at what it does. And this card is going is going to see competitive play. I think this is going to be primo removal post-rotation in standard. This is an instant tear asunder, one in a green with kicker, one in a black. Exile target artifact or enchantment. If the spell was kicked, exile target non-land permanent instead. So we have a couple things here. One, it is super disenchant immediately like or naturalize like immediately this is outclassing naturalize or disenchant like if you're not familiar with naturalize it, it was an instant for one in a green destroy target artifact or enchantment solid card did its job did it well it was a classic terra sunder does that except it exiles so it gets the enchantment or artifact off the field forever and if you kick it if you add an additional two mana one of which has to be black all of a sudden you exile target non-land permanent. All of a sudden you can hit planeswalkers, you can hit creatures. It, the sky's the limit on this thing. It opens up big time. I'm a big fan of Binding the Old Gods. That is in a saga right now, the first chapter of which is destroy target non-land permanent. Great card, very, very useful. And one that I have leveraged a lot um, in various mid-range decks because it's just really good removal. Binding also ramps you, this doesn't do that, but it is, Two generic, one black, one green, exile target, non-land permanent. That effect is no joke. Being able to have no restrictions on that is a big freaking deal. So keep an eye out for this card. I think it is going to see, it's going to see play maybe as like a, as a, maybe like a two of in some main decks, but with the other two in the sideboard, I would not be surprised if this is a, if it's, if it's a sideboard all-star, like any situation where you need a naturalized style effect, this has got you. And if you're in green and black, like I, th I think to be honest, if you're running a mid-range deck with Golgari in it, this this needs to be on your radar, you know. And I think it's gonna it's gonna slot into those decks and fill a very important slot right away. So great card, phenomenal, uncommon. I'm gonna be really jazzed uh, to open these, and yeah, great stuff. All right, next up, <clears throat> we are finishing out the Defiler cycle. So if you've been paying attention, uh, Wizards has been releasing a whole series of cards called Defiler of such and such. Um, and all of them have some themes going on with them. The vast majority of them so far have been five drops. The two that we're gonna be talking about today are both four drops, but they're monocolor and they give permanent spells that you control uh, Phyrexian mana. It takes one of the colored mana pips and turns it into a Phyrexian mana so you can spend two life rather than pay the mana value. That actually, I think is incredibly powerful. We'll see how good it is in certain decks, but I think it has the potential to be great. And then all of them also have some crazy ability that whenever you cast a permanent spell of their color, they do something bananas. So here we have Defiler of Flesh. This is the back one, black one. It is Phyrexian Horror, 4-4 four, four Menace for two black black. Oh, that's another thing. All of their stat lines are pretty decent for what they are. But here we go. So we have Phyrexian Horror, 4-4 four, four Menace for four. As an additional cost to cast black permanent spells, you may pay two life. Those spells cost two black less, um, if you pay life this way, the effect reduces only the amount of black mana you, you pay. Okay, cool. And whenever you cast a black permanent spell, target creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and gains menace. 
until end of turn. So giving creatures menace is no joke and being able to buff creatures is pretty good. The issue that I have with Defiler of Flesh specifically is that those buffs are temporary. When you compare this to Defiler of Vigor, the green one, which is a 6-6 six, six Trampler for five, the Defiler of Vigor says whenever you cast a green permanent spell, you put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. The power level comparison, the power level difference between those two abilities is night and day. I mean, Defiler of Flesh is significantly worse, significantly worse than Defiler of Vigor. Like it's not even like they're not even the same discussion. The fact that they're part of the same cycle is kind of crazy. Now, to be fair with Defiler of Flesh, it is one mana cheaper. It only costs four. And then after this, all of your black permanent spells all of a sudden have Phyrexian mana associated with them. So there's something to be said for that. You know, all of a sudden you're casting, you can cast your one drop zombies or whatever for for two life instead of mana. Um, so that could be v beneficial. And <clears throat> as you do, you get to kind of prowess one of your creatures and give it menace or give multiple creatures menace. Like if a black aggro deck is a thing, post rotation or even like a Rakdos aggro deck uh, post rotation, Defiler Flesh might have a chance. But if it's not, I don't think this card is going to see play anywhere. Um, it's a cool design, a cool idea. I like it. But again, not all Defilers are created equal. And I think this, is, this might actually be the worst of the whole cycle. With the possible exception being the blue one. I don't like the blue one very much either. But to be honest, um, the, the power of these cards also lies in what you are cheating out. What permanence are you casting? And in the case of Defiler Flesh, to be fair, we do have access to Meat Hook Massacre. So being able to lower the mana cost on Meat Hook Massacre and buff it up, um, you know, get it out earlier and hit for a higher X, that might be very meaningful. And I might be underselling it. Uh, you know, I, I might be underestimating this card just because Meat Hook Massacre is going to stay post rotation. But we'll see. We'll see. I think that, that that's a key synergy. But beyond that, I'm not I'm not really feeling it. I'll probably try to brew around this card, but I'll, I'll probably try to brew around, brew around all the Defilers in one way or another. We'll see. We'll see what happens here. Um, actually, the other thing about the Defilers that I want to throw out, it looks like these all should be in monocolor decks. Like, they look like they're really leaning into monocolors if you want to maximize the abilities. However, in a five-color deck, this can effectively remove one of the colored pips from a spell. You know, from a permanent spell. You know, if we hit Defiler of Flesh on four, or we ramp into it, hit it on three, all of a sudden we can be casting Jota, you know potentially earlier, potentially for less, I don't know. Or Kami War. All of a sudden, like these can help you ramp into Kami War. I don't know if that's gonna be a thing. I don't know if it's gonna be worthwhile, but it could be fun and I kinda wanna try it. So the fact that it costs four rather than five, unlike a lot of the other ones, is meaningful. Like don't don't get it twisted, that is relevant. Speaking of four mana defilers, and I'm sorry that this is in, um, I apologize that the, the image that I have is actually not in English. Actually, let me, Give the old refresh. Yep, nope, still not. Anyway, <laughs> this is Defiler of Instincts. This is the red one. It is a 4-4 first striker with the Phyrexian mana ability for red permanence. And it says whenever you cast a red permanent spell, deal one damage, I believe to any target. Uh, yeah, to any target. Sorry for scrolling there. But it deals one damage to any target. So these are pings that you get repeatedly by casting red permanent spells, which you can cast for life instead of... Um, instead of mana. And on top of that, it's a 4-4 first striker for four. First strike is a very big deal, especially on a four power creature. So don't sleep on that. I think this card is decent. Um, it's funny, because when you look at the the black defiler and compare it to the red one, they look kind of equally meh. But to be honest, I think in the red decks, this card is going to be significantly more powerful than the black one is for the black decks, because in a red burn style deck or in a red aggro deck where you have a lot of cheap creatures, this is going to help you get those cheap creatures out. And we've had a couple, we've seen, like we, ha we have a number of 1-1 haste creatures in the format right now. And so being able to add just instant damage for those. Also, this is going to be dropping early because it's a four drop. We've seen Boros aggro and red aggro decks get to four drops very consistently. And because those decks are putting so much pressure on the opponent so fast, what's happening is their life total is chilling at 20 because they've been the aggressor the whole time. Meaning that once you get to four mana with this thing, any red permanence you have in your hand, you just vomit them onto the board and you burn as much life as it takes and you don't care. 
and a lot of those are going to have haste they're going to be swinging in potentially right away on turn four alongside this thing and dealing additional damage at the same time i mean this card has some cool implications and i think it, it it's nice and pings add up bottom line pings add up they they do and in red aggro i think this this card could have a home i like it also its creature type is kavu i love that it's a phyrexian kavu how terrifying is that anyway cool card i like it it's funny because yeah again it looks very uh lackluster similar to the black defiler but i think this one i, I think this one's gonna have a home yeah all right next up we have a rare piece of removal in leyline binding this is an enchantment for five and a white with flash and domain this spell costs one less to cast for each basic land type among lands you control when leyline binding enters the battlefield exile target non-land permanent a con an opponent controls until leyline binding leaves the battlefield so this is similar to a banishing light style effect where you get to exile something until it leaves the battlefield cool that's actually really good and on top of that, his converted mana cost is six. So if you're in a deck that cares about mana costs or in older formats, if you're going up against like removal, like March of the Worldly Light, well, that could be standard, or um, you know, March of the Worldly Light or Prismatic Ending in Modern that care about the mana value of the thing you're targeting, Leyline Binding costs six. So it's going to be very tough to interact with in that regard, which is awesome. And it has flash. If you have one Triome down, so if you that, that gives you three basic land types among your lands. <clears throat> this costs three, two and a white. And it's a flash speed banishing light. In a three color deck, this card is great. If you're in a full five color deck and this is a banishing light that you can cast at flash speed for one, that's bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. You can use it in combat as a combat trick. You can use it at the end step to get rid of a pesky permanent before you untap on your turn. You can like blow out something that's being targeted by a spell like it's insane the kind of stuff you can do with this card and it may cost as little as one and it even puts a permanent on your battlefield if you care about enchantments like if you're in a selesnia or or a naya enchantment matters deck this is going to fit perfectly like I, I, this card is going to be we're, we're going to see this card it's just solid removal it does the thing and it doesn't at flash speed if you are a fan of banishing light oblivion ring seal away freaking <laughs> like borrowed time which is going to be in standard if you're running borrowed time especially in three color decks like this could just be your second third fourth copy of borrowed time easily easily yeah i think this card's going to see a ton of play so keep an eye out for it all right, next up, we have the Elder Dragon War. One thing that actually we've been seeing with Saga cards as of late is artists using mixed medium. Um, and if you haven't seen the photograph of the artwork for this card, it is beautiful. It is actually a wood carving. Uh, so definitely like search on Twitter or find like MTG art sites, go find that. It's lovely. Um, it's very cool. They did a great job on it. Um, but, and, and I'll be honest, like the card truly does not do that peace justice. But in any event, this is a four mana, two red red saga with read ahead, which means you can you can choose what chapter you start on. Uh, skip chapters, don't trigger. And for chapter one, the Elder Dragon War deals two damage to each creature and each opponent. Chapter two, discard any number of cards, then draw that many cards. And then chapter three, create a 4-4 red dragon creature token with flying. So one thing that I've heard a lot of people mention is it's a 4-4 dragon for flying with flying for four. And yes, if that's what you need in the moment, it can get you there. We have seen a number of 4-4 dragons for four with upsides that are not seeing play. Some of which aren't even rotating. Moonvale Regent, um, the uh, Maniform Hellkite, those aren't going anywhere. They're four mana. Four, four dragons for four that frankly just don't see play because they're not great now they may get some support pieces and we may see that change but for the moment a four four dragon for four doesn't really move the needle for me it just doesn't um you know, like it's one of those car it's one of those stat lines that should be good and it just oftentimes is very underwhelming so i'm not amazed by chapter three but at the same time if we can get good value off one and two and then get that incidentally i'm not mad so i think the big benefit of this card is chapter one in mid-range decks or decks that care about large expensive creatures in the late game early board wipes are a very big deal if if aggro continues to be a thing and we see a lot of 
you know, three power, one toughness, three power, two toughness creatures running around in the meta, if that those are adopted and utilized, this on turn four is gonna be a way to deal a ton of damage to your opponent's board state while you are setting up your late game plan. You know, that's actually one of the things when you look at dragon decks or angel decks historically some of those do run board maybe not angel decks so much but in dragon decks you see it a lot especially in like commander and things where they run a ton of board wipes because on turns three and four they don't really have many or if any creatures on the board so you want to be able to wipe the board completely and then deploy your creatures after you've knocked your opponent out, you know not out of the game completely but definitely like set them back a ways and then you deploy your strategy and take advantage from there elder dragon war lines up with that nicely and on top of that since it's only two damage like it's not going to be wrecking your day either if you have larger creatures online so if a mid-range like dragon strategy or something that involves large creatures in the light game um is a thing elder dragon war might be a part of it so cool card i like it on top of that you know it's a it's a permanent so the defiler can do its thing um i don't know it's interesting it's, it's an interesting design. I like this. Read Ahead, I think, is very powerful. I think Read Ahead gives you some supreme flexibility, and these sagas are well-designed. So it'll be very interesting to see if they continue, uh, or to, to see if they see play. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm very interested to see how these get adopted. Um, also, though, one thing I do want to point out, some of the modes, especially Chapter 2, feel very similar to Fable of the Mirror Breaker. And Fable of the Mirror Breaker, this is not. Fable, I think, is excellent on a whole other level. This card could be good. I don't think it's as good as Fable. It's not going to unseat Fable anytime soon. Um, who knows? We might see a deck that wants both, but I'd be surprised. All right, next up. This card is insane. I cannot wait to use it. And that card is Ivy Gleeful Spell Thief. And I think this is probably going to be my next historic brawl deck post-rotation. Ivy Gleeful Spell Thief is a 2-1 flying fairy rogue for green-blue. Whenever a player casts a spell that targets only a single creature other than Ivy, Gleeful Spell Thief, you may copy that spell. The copy targets Ivy. So it's a May ability. If your opponent casts a kill spell, the game will ask you, do you want to copy that? Say no, because the copy would, would target Ivy. Um, in very rare cases, would you want to do that? However, if your opponent plays an aura or a mutate creature targeting one of their creatures... Arena will ask you, do you want to copy it? The answer to that is yes, you absolutely do, because that is going to drop onto Ivy. And that's going to be insane. You get all of their stuff, you get all of your stuff. This card is going to produce some crazy value. Uh, additionally, I want to work this alongside the duplication, the duplicity card. Duplomancy? Duplomancy. I think that was the word. Anyway, <laughs> the duplomancy card we were talking about earlier. I want to have creatures on board that care about being targeted by stuff, and I want to target them with stuff. And when I target them with stuff, I target Ivy with stuff, incidentally, which creates additional copies of Ivy, which I'm targeting with all my stuff. The potential value snowball there is absolutely bonkers. I cannot wait to get my hands on this. I think it's going to be absolutely insane. Add in cards like the Defiler cycle, like the White Defiler or the Green Defiler, and all of a sudden, you can poten potentially cast auras for very, very cheap or completely free in the case of, you know, you know, spending life instead of mana. And you can create a whole army of IVs that you can then copy with stuff. I, I, this like, I, or you're, you can copy a ton of IVs and you're copying spells left and right when you're doing it. Go into older formats where Magecraft is still gonna be legal. Like that has a potential to be a thing. Uh, the, the, the major problem that I see with this card that may limit it from, um, from competitive play is that it only has one toughness. That is a big problem. You're going to need to run this in decks that also have cards like Tamiyo Safekeeping. Um, you know, those kind of effects that can protect it or slip out the back. Those are going to be very important pieces to guard IV as you go. That is going to be a big deal. Um, but at the same time, I think some kind of combat tricks matter or enchantment matters, Simic or Bant deck could really get out of hand with this card and uh is it this is going to be kill on sight the moment you see it like if you and as a result if you are playing with ivy wait wait until you have three mana up so you can hold up a slip out the back a tamio safekeeping even a spell pierce something that can protect ivy that's going to be very important because people are going to be gunning for this card um but it's going to be really cool when it works <laughs> it's going to be so cool when it works so keep an eye out for this thing i think it's great and it's only two it only goes two what's not to love all right, 
Next up, <clears throat> we have Vidalion Hexcaller. This is a 1-1 merfolk wizard for one and a blue with flash that says other merfolk you control get plus one plus one. Sacrifice a merfolk, counter target non-creature spell unless this controller pays one. This is a phenomenal trick that you can play on your opponent in a lot of different ways. This provides you two things that you want at flash speed. It provides a Lord effect that buffs your entire team of, if your entire team is made up of Merfolk, which if you're running this card, there's a good chance you have a lot of other Merfolk in your deck. So it's an instant speed Anthem effect for your whole team. And on top of that, if your opponent is trying to cast out a spell, they may think, okay, like let's say they're trying to cast a Meat Hook Massacre. Or let's say they tapped out for a Meat Hook Massacre or Doomscar or some other board wipe. You can cast Vidalion Hexcaller and frankly, even sacrifice itself if you don't have any other merfolk lying around and all of a sudden you're hitting your opponent with a Jawari Disruption. I mean, that's the floor on this card. The floor on this card is Jawari Disruption. You play it, sacrifice it, counter target non-creature spell unless the controller pays one. Not a perfect Jawari Disruption because that could hit any spell, but still, like, that's great. And if you have merfolk, like if you're attacking with a bunch of merfolk and your opponent lines blocks up, you can flash this in and all of a sudden buff your whole squad and if they have any kind of combat tricks that they're trying to pull off on you you may be able to sacrifice merfolk to counter those combat tricks like this gives you a ton of flexibility now the decision points are here with this card you need to play it very carefully you need to be aware of all your resources and leverage them correctly so be careful with this card but when it hits it's going to be fantastic so good stuff. I, I think this card is insane. There are a ton, there's a whole sequence of two mana lords in this set. They're great. Like I think all of them are pretty fantastic for what they do. And I think the Vidalion Hex Caller specifically is like, if you're in Merfolk, you run this card. I, and like I think even in older formats, if you're in Merfolk, you just run this card. It's great. All right. <clears throat> Next up, we have Rivaz of the Claw. This is a three three Vyashino Warlock for one black red. This is legendary. So that might go in that Legendary's deck, just a thought. Um, <laughs> with Menace, 3-3 three, three Menace for, th for three. Tap, add two mana in any combination of colors. Spend this mana only to cast a dragon creature spells. So if you're in dragons, this ramps you from three to six if you're in your land drops. I mean, that's incredible. Being able to buff buff your mana base by two, if you're casting, again, if you're casting dragons, fantastic. And then once during each of your turns, you may cast a dragon creature spell from your graveyard. Whenever you cast a dragon creature spell from your graveyard, it gains when this creature dies, exile it. Your dragons have flashback now. That's insane. Talk about a card. So this is card advantage. It provides, well, and it gives you mana advantage. So it gives you a big buff in mana in Rakdos if you care about dragons. And on top of that, you can then cast dragons from your freaking graveyard. I think this card is going to be huge in like Explorer Tiamat decks. I think that's gonna be a thing. Unfortunately, Tiamat is rotating out of standard. Otherwise, that would be a slam dunk in that deck. Um, but if you're in Alchemy, you have Mirim. That could be gross, like straight up gross. Um, doesn't fit in, in the Mirim Brawl decks, thank goodness, because of the black mana cost, but still, um, th those cards will get along famously. And like, if Dragon Tribal becomes becomes a thing, this card is absolutely going to be a piece of it. You know, we have Zeatora, we have uh, Maniform Hellkite, like I mentioned. We have um, we have the um, I'm blanking on the name, Moonvale Region. That's the one I'm thinking of. If we're in multiple colors, if we if we have multiple colors and we have dragons in the mix, Moonvale Region is great. We can be ramping up to five color Kami War with this, which you can't cast from the graveyard because it's not a dragon. Um, on its front face, but still like I, I think the sky's the limit with this card and there are some other great legendary dragons in Dominaria United So there's a very real possibility. Oh not to mention the Shivan Dev Devastator is a dragon Hydra It's just X and a red for an XX flying trampler. Is this trample? Anyway, uh, yeah, I think it is trample bonkers crazy stuff. So uh, I, I think this card is very powerful Like again, just full stop. It's just this in the right deck so, like, we might see Jun Dragons, we might see, like, four or five color dragons. Rivas absolutely fits. Like, absolutely. Like, potential four of, even though he's legendary. Like, I think this card's gonna be absolutely great. You're gonna wanna hit it on turn three every game. All right, <clears throat> and next up, this is gonna be the last card that we talk about for today. It is Aether Channeler. This is a 2-1 human wizard for two and a blue. When it enters the battlefield, choose one. Create a 1-1 white bird creature token with flying. 
return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, or draw a card. We have come a very long way from Mana War, ladies and gentlemen. This card is awesome. The bounce ability on it is a huge tempo advantage. The potential to just draw a card, like worst case scenario, you just draw a card. If there's nothing to bounce or anything, nothing wrong with that. If you need to get in for some additional points of damage, there's the bird token that it can leave behind. And this is also an ETB trigger. So in situations where you can take advantage of blinks, if you can blink this out of existence, bring it back, you get it again and again. And again, potentially, if we're in a situation where you have, you know, teleportation, circle, Thassa style effects, they allow you to blink every turn. We've got cards like uh, Planner Incision. Like, and to be honest, we could even be doing stuff with cards like Planner Incision with this and the Vesuvian Di Diplomancy, where if we have Aether Channeler, yeah, that's happening, I'm doing that. If you put Aether Channeler on the board, uh, if you have Vesuvian Diplomancy online, you can target Aether Channeler, Planner Incision is a card from Kamigawa for one and a blue. Exile target, I believe non-land permanent you control. Return to the battlefield at your end step with a plus one plus one counter on it. If we have Duplomancy online, we target Aether Channeler. We can also, if our opponent tries to remove Aether Channeler, we can use this in response to save it. But Duplomancy would trigger, we get another Aether Channeler, we get this trigger again, potentially bounce something back to our opponent's hand or draw a card. And then at our end step, our other Aether Channeler comes back and we get to, we get another draw effect or we get to bounce another thing. That can set our opponent back really far. So those kinds of synergies are alive and well in this set and I cannot wait to take advantage of them. And Aether Channeler is a part of that. I think it is fair that this card is at rare because of the flexibility it offers. You know, we've seen cards like the Cloudkin, what, Cloudkin Sage, the elemental from the core set that draws you cards. It's a two one flyer for three. We've seen Mana War as just, you know, it's a three drop that bounces a thing. We've seen those cards before, but the fact that this one is kind of all of them all at once and it can produce a bird token, like if that's relevant, great. I mean, I think this card's awesome. It's just absolutely fantastic. And this is going to see play in a lot of, yeah, if you're doing blink stuff, if you're doing ETB stuff, there's no reason not to have it. Also, the, the, um, the angel that we were talking about can pull this back from your graveyard. Just saying. So... Sky's the limit with some of this stuff. I, it's going to be crazy. I think this set is going to be really good. I like what I've seen so far. The power level looks like it is strong without being broken, which is exactly where I want to see it. We're going to see some very cool cards that are very different from other stuff we've seen before, and they are going to shake up standard in a big way. And I, for one, can't wait. Rotation is going to be coming to Arena on September 1st. It is going to be coming to Paper, I believe, the 9th. So keep an eye out for those. And uh, yeah, I just, I can't wait. And if you want to see what, the, what kind of weird shenanigans I'm going to be up to over on Twitch, twitch.tv slash 42 I'm looking forward to seeing you over there. So thank you so much and I hope you have a great day.